for the introduction. Well, you already know my name now. Um, I come to this conference from Darmstadt, Germany. So far, I'm really enjoying Lyon and this conference, amazing talks. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub. My handle is T60, and I'm here to talk about large-scale Rails applications. Before we dive into the Rails aspect of this talk, I want to briefly talk about software development first. For me, software development is about building sustainable software products. But what does sustainability in the context of software development actually mean? For me, uh, sustainable software products are products that adapt, that specifically adapt to changing uh, business requirements. And change is actually the first thing I want to talk to about today. The thing with change is that it is one of the most uh, diff difficult obstacles you have to deal with in your life as a software developer, but it all is also inevitable. And in this sense, you need to design your system to withstand change. For me, a software product is very much like a living organism. And when we look at evolutionary processes and change from a biological perspective, then um, we notice that organisms that are unable to adapt die. And this can happen to your software product as well if you don't uh, start dealing with change um, early enough. And in this sense, I think change is actually a good thing and you should embrace it. Because, again, when we uh, look at this from a biological perspective, we see that the evolutionary processes have taken us pretty far and that the result is pretty amazing. The other obstacle you have to face when you build large-scale Rails applications is growth. And growth usually leads to complexity. And unlike change, complexity is actually something you should try to avoid at all costs because a complex system is harder to reason about and complexity ultimately reduces the velocity in your team because you start uh, spending more time on reading code and understanding what is there instead of implementing new features. But we are lucky because strategies that enable change usually re reduce complexity at the same time because complexity and changeability of a system are somewhat mutually dependent. But let's look at these two things from a more technical perspective. Systems that are easy to change are modular systems. But what makes a modular system? Well, a modular system consists of components that do one thing and one thing only. And as software developers, we have a special term for this. We like to call this software highly cohesive. And when I started taking software design classes, everybody told me that highly cohesive systems with low coupling, that's the thing to go for. The problem is they don't tell you the downside of highly cohesive systems. If you have a lot of components, then simply your structural complexity is increased because having 500 components with only a few lines of code is not necessarily easier than having 50 uh, components with a lot of code. But structurally, uh, structural complexity is something we can deal with easily. It starts with organizing your code in a meaningful way. And um, you can and both the macro level of organization as well as the micro level are important. With macro level, I mean where you put files in your directories and how you lay out the entire project structure. And on the micro level, I mean the readability of individual code fragments. The other thing that is very important and makes um, and reduces the complexity of a system is if you start adhering to rules and conventions. And I don't necessarily only mean rules and conventions that are dictated by frameworks, but I also refer to the rules and conventions you and your teammates come up with uh, to solve the problem at hand. I mentioned low coupling already, and that basically is that components should know as little as possible. But let's talk about Ruby on Rails and what change and growth means for Ruby on Rails. 
I personally like Rails really a lot for building web applications. And there's a lot of discussion going on whether um, there are missing elements to Rails or not. And I have to say, for small applications, there's really anything you need um, already provided. But with larger applications, and I'm talking about applications that um, pass the 100,000 lines of code mark, there's just, there are just uh, missing elements. And because you cannot simply put your code in one of those three boxes that are model view and controllers, but you have to think about how you can extend Rails in a reasonable way to solve your problem. And I want to talk about one specific problem today, and that is how you can model complex business processes, because there's really no process provided um, with Rails that helps you out with this problem. The reason why I focus on complex business processes is that creating a user is hardly as easy as adding a record to the database, because when you create a user, you might have to send an email, you have to track certain statistics, and um, everything else your customer can, can come up with. And implementing complex business processes start with understanding the business process and truly analyzing the problem that your customer has. And once you have a clear understanding of what you are trying to solve, then try to resemble this problem as closely as possible in code as you can. And for that, I like to organize my code in so-called business transaction. And the idea behind this is documented um, in the book and uh, Patterns of Enterprise Architectures, um, and which is written by Martin Fowler. And Martin Fowler also um, documented the active record pattern. And in his book, he specifically states that the idea behind organizing code in business transactions or using the so-called transaction script pattern plays very nice with active record. Another benefit of transaction scripts is the web itself is transactional. So you can think of sending a request to a service trigger triggering exactly one transaction. And I already mentioned that it plays nice with active record. And in this sense, it is ideal for Ruby on Rails applications. There are two ways you can implement a transaction script. There's a very simple one where you simply implement one static function, function per transaction. But I always stick to the latter one, especially in large Rails applications, because a long function is not enough. So I always go um, and use the one class approach. So I have the possibility of extracting um, code fragments out into individual methods. To make this even easier, I wrote a gem called composable operations. And you might think, why isn't it called transaction something? Well, the reason is because the gem as it is implemented provides more features than um, the transaction script um, foresaw. And now I want to actually finally show you some code and um, show you how you can model um, a simple business process first and then continue to present a more complex one. The process um, I want to model is exporting CSV um, from uh, basically any record. So we have an, uh, on this slide, uh, we have an operation that accepts a set of records or a list of records to be more precise and accepts a configuration parameter called attributes that tells uh, the operation which attributes you want to be exported into CSV. And um, it is actually a super simple operation uh, in the sense that we just iterate over the records and convert each record into an array representation, which is then converted into a string. And for the sake of completeness, this is the convert operation. But let's talk about the individual aspects that make up an operation. There is the call to the macro method processes 
And what this method does, it defines the positional arguments that the constructor of your operation takes when you invoke it, and we will see this in a minute. And you can specify an arbitrary amount of positional arguments you want to provide. In the case of our CSV export, uh, we provide an array of records. But you could think of an operation called add user to group, where you would provide a user and a group. Then there's the macro method property, and this, this method is used to provide configuration options. Again, these are supplied as keyword arguments to the constructor of your operation. And properties are simply better Ruby assessors in the sense that they provide default values, that you can flag them as mandatory, that they provide auto conversion upon assignment, and that they provide uh, the possibility of validating the input. And the example below on the slide uh, implements a property called limit, which has a default of five, um, is flagged as required, and converts any value upon assignment into an integer, and finally checks that this integer is greater than zero. If you like the idea of these properties, I extracted the code out into a separate gem called smart, pro uh, smart properties. Back to operations. Let's talk about the most important aspect, and this is certainly the algorithmic core of your operation. And it is the only thing you really need to implement, and you do this by defining the execute method. Now that we know how to define an operation, let's see how, can, how we can invoke one. Well, there are two ways. First, you can instantiate an operation, provide all the positional arguments as well as the configuration options, to the constructor and then simply call the perform method on this instance. Or you can uh, use the perform class method right away and provide all the necessary attributes. You might have noticed that you implement execute, but you call perform. The reason for that is that operations have state and provide advanced control flow mechanisms, as we will see now. An operation can have four states. It can either not be, yet ex uh, not be executed yet, it can have been successfully executed, or it can be in two failure states, halted and failed. And in order to transition to the state, you have to explicitly use the fail or halt method in your operation. And fail takes the same arguments as race does. As for control flow, Operations provide the execution of filters before and after um, the execution of the algorithmic core. In both types of filters, you can fail or hold an operation should you decide that the operation uh, has, in fact, um, not successfully been executed. To give you an example, we extend the CSV export operation with a before filter. The filter does two things. It converts the array um, of records in an array, just in case uh, it hasn't been one before. And then it loops over all the records and checks that every record in the array responds to the um, configured attributes. Um, if there's one record that does not respond to the attributes, the operation fails and will tell you that um, the expected interface is not implemented. Using the class method to invoke this operation, now that it has the before filter, will raise an argument error if um, the records you provide are faulty. Using, however, the instance method, that is, instantiating the operation manually, will not result in an argument error. Instead, um, it is assumed that you have the that you have a reference to the um, to the instance around that you can uh, then and that you can further inspect to see what actually went wrong. CSV export as it is now is not very flexible because we assume that any attribute we want to export is actually implemented by um, our model object. But maybe we want to have additional columns, or we want to map columns to different names. Well, an easy approach to solve this would be to use, utilize a decorator pattern 
and I've done precisely uh, this for this example. Now, before we convert a record into um, a, an, ar an array representation, we simply decorate it. And decorate is implemented unobtrusively if no decorator has been specified. Um, we simply return the record, otherwise we wrap the record with this decorator. But is CSV export a true business transaction? Well, I said earlier that we should aim at modeling the business requirements our customer has as closely as possible. And it is very unlikely that our customer will come to us and tell us that he needs generic um, CSV export. Instead, he will much more likely say, I need a list of users over the age of 21, and I need to be able to regularly export this list. And while I always aim with complex business transactions to model them as closely as the true requirement, there's of course nothing wrong at aiming for code reusability. You just have to be aware that if you have a very generic operation and you are going to change this at some point, many of the business um, transactions will actually be affected. But as long as you keep this in mind, there's nothing wrong, and I would actually usually go for implementing generic op operations that you can use in multiple places. Operations can also be combined into a processing pipeline. And a processing pipeline is simply a set of components connected in series where the output of one component acts as the input of the next component. And this is actually use, uh, um, really useful if you have extremely complex but very linear business transactions to implement. So if it feels already too much to put all the code into one class, then you could go for a pipeline. And it is fairly simple to implement. Um, we have here a pipeline called some pipeline that simply inherits from composed operation and once a class inherits from composed operation, it has access to the use macro method. So in this case, we define a pipeline that uses two operations, operation A and B. And when we execute this pipeline, the input that we provide to some pipeline is first fed into operation A. The result of operation A is then forwarded to operation B, and some pipeline finally returns the result that was returned by operation B. And I want to show you a real-world example for um, operation pipelining. And um, I want to talk about importing a list of users. Again, let's assume our customer comes to us and wants to import um, users in CSV data. And he provides us with um, a CSV data file that contains three columns, name, family, name, and age. But our user model looks different because internally we use the identifiers first name and last name and we require an email as well as a password. So in order to import this data, we actually need to solve five steps. We need to first parse the CSV, which is pretty straightforward with Ruby. We then need to uh, synchronize the input just to be on the safe side. And then we need to map columns and generate, if possible, data for the missing columns, and finally instantiate the user records. And an implementation could look something like this, where we have an operation that accepts two configuration parameters. These configuration parameters define mappings and generators. Mappings could, uh, is simply a hash that maps a column name to a field name, and generators um, contains a bunch of lambda expressions. I sadly don't have to, the time to go into the five components that I used here, um, because I want to show you a more advanced example that builds on top of this one. Let's say we get a second customer, and now this customer provides us with JSON data. Well, good thing is that we pulled out the code that does the data mapping and the data generation and the user 
creation into their own operations, so we can utilize them. But compared to the CSV import operation, there's only one line that changed. So for me, this still feels like a lot of code duplication. What we, what we ideally would do is choose the parser at runtime so that we can decide uh, whether or, uh, we want to parse JSON or CSV. And for that, we need a placeholder. And again, we can combine the uh, idea of a transaction script with another pattern because there's a pattern for implementing placeholder, and that is the proxy pattern. A proxy pattern, a proxy operation could look like this, where we um, build an operation that accepts as its own input an operation and options that is, it is then going to forward to the operation. And when the proxy is executed, it simply instantiates the operation, then performs it, and then clones the state. So ba it t basically takes the state of the operation it wrapped and um, provides this back to the pipeline that was calling the proxy operation. And now we end up with an operation that uses as the first operation in uh, uh, as the first operational component, the proxy, and we can, and by adding an additional configuration option, we are able to pass in the parser from the outside. So we can can inject the dependency for whether we want to parse CSV or uh, JSON from the outside. And if we now extend our class simply with a couple of convenience method, we couldn't end up with an interface that looks as simple as import.csv and then provide the file name and import.json and again provide the file name. And the beauty of this is whenever a colleague that hasn't looked into this piece of code yet uh, will stumble across this line, he will immediately understand what's going on. He might not know what, uh, how your business transaction works inside, but he will understand what the business transaction does and he will probably be able to figure out how to use it if he should ever need to import CSV or JSON data himself. Let's talk about integrating all this stuff into Ruby on Rails. Well, I like to put my operations in app operations and I usually simply call them from my con controllers. So for me, an operation sits in between the controller and the model object. The last thing I want to talk about is testing operations, because the business transactions are what you make. Uh, uh, the business transactions are a very important part of your application, and I aimed at simplifying the testing by providing predefined measures for RSpec. So. Um, there is a measure for the success case and the failure case. Um, if you want to test the successful execution, you simply um, expect the operation to succeed to perform um, when initialized with a given set of positional arguments and keyboard arguments. And then there's the failure case uh, where you expect the operation to fail to perform and you can specify an exception and a message that should be raised. For me, the nice thing about business transactions is that they group the code by the underlying business process. So there's ideally one place where you need to change code if the real world business process that you try to model changes. And operations provide a unified in interface independent of the underlying business process. If you know how to use one operation, you certainly know how to use all the other operations um, that you use in your project. And finally, the flexible composition mechanisms makes it easy to implement very complex business transactions that ideally utilize um, more generic operation components. And for me, this ultimately simplifies the understandability of a system as I can simply look at, um, at the code from a more abstract level 
I just look at the name of the operation and the input it takes and I don't necessarily need to care about the internal implementation to understand what is going on. Thank you very much.